Hello, welcome everyone to our panel uh, with the title Travel, Discover, Change, Simple Recipe for Success. Uh, we're going to talk about how success uh, and new technologies, great achievements can come really from most unlikely places. Uh, the leapfrogging today is enabling us uh, also to get very innovative ideas where we didn't expect them. Uh, so please welcome my guests today. With that, uh, founder and CEO of Sorted Celli uh, and Tunya, the investor from 500 Emerging Europe. Round of applause, please. Brilliant. So with that, can you tell us more about yourself? Uh, how did you come up with this idea? What we know is that basically you had a very su successful career uh, in banking in HSBC. And then you made this brilliant change, went towards the startup world and uh, opened up your own startup in focused on Africa, in Ghana, if I'm correct. Yeah, so happy to expand a little bit. So hi, everyone. My name is Vedette. Um, so I actually have a career in the banking world working in digital products. So working on um, API and marketplaces, so open banking specifically. So I did that for um, just over four years, working in the UK and in Hong Kong. Um, so in 2020, December, I decided to resign from my job in Hong Kong to go and start what essentially is to become a travel tech company focused on experiences in Africa and for people who want to experience Africa regardless of where they are. So that's what the story looks like. It's been two years of building a travel tech company essentially in the middle of a pandemic and now growing it to kind of pivot and truly become tech focused and create this marketplace of experiences um, in Africa. Ultimately, kind of like an Airbnb experiences for Africa, um, Airbnb experiences meets couch surfing, which is what we're trying to build currently. So that's brilliant. Uh, would you say that pandemic in the end uh, was good for you? Because people kind of also changed their habits the way they think, the way they travel as well? Actually, that's a brilliant question because a lot of people assume that the pandemic was terrible for my business. But on the contrary, it was actually pretty good. Um, and obviously, my empathy to anyone who suffered as a result of the pandemic. But in terms of its effect on um, the business in Africa, it was good in the sense that a lot of other countries and continents had a lot of barriers to entry. So that was multiple kind of COVID tests or um, you know, having to quarantine in a hotel, like Hong Kong, where I used to live, you had to do a two-week quarantine before you could actually access the country. Whereas countries in Africa were pretty open because the effect of, of COVID wasn't as bad because of the young population. So it meant that a lot of the people who would typically travel to Asia, who would travel to Europe, now had their eyes on Africa as a travel destination because the barriers to entry were so low. So within a year of business, we were seeing six figures, like we were doing very well as a business as a result of the shift that happened in the travel industry because of COVID-19. So surprisingly, we were born out of a crisis, but we managed to capitalize and make opportunities for ourselves in that moment. Wow, brilliant. So Tonya, can you tell us more about basically the same topic, like the, the uh, as far as I know, for two years now, you are working as an investor uh, for 500 Emerging Europe. So also you're investing for, uh, in early stage startups uh, in Central Eastern Europe and Turkey. So you also have this experience of the doing business and starting the businesses uh, in pandemic and in the parts of the world that are basically not a Silicon Valley. Can you tell us more about it? How has it been for you as an investor? Uh, as, an, as an investor in a emerging markets, investor in multiple emerging markets, we experience some booming effect in B2B SaaS, especially because it actually, COVID eventually affected our lives in a sense that we uh, speeded up the uh, digital adoption, especially it began with corporate companies who have like very traditional pen and paper processes, etc. So this actually uh, affected that change. And uh, in Turkey, for example, we experienced a lot of uh, starting with banks and big financial institutions and then uh, some FMCG companies, they actually started their own accelerator programs and then established their corporate VCs 
to support and get them included in their traditional processes and they also started this digital transformation in their own companies. So actually, uh, we experienced that, that shift and which effect, this eventually affected the startup ecosystem because the capital that was allocated for digital transformation and also for the equity rounds and the safe rounds, etc., that it actually eventually boomed up. So this is what actually we experienced. And I, I think it's, it's a very similar thing in Central Eastern Europe because we also see like lots of digital in innovation centers and corporate VCs emerge out of these economies. And in Turkey, after COVID, uh, we uh, experienced a lot of raise in capital. All, I guess almost all of the VCs in Turkey, they deployed their first funds and they established their second fund, which is the case for us as well. We fundraised between 2020 and the beginning of 2021, and we started deploying our fund in around March 2021. So, uh, yeah, that was actually affected the sales and uh, lots of companies, especially from, from, from glo gro global presence, they actually wanted to acquire or acquire the Turkish talent because they also know this tra digital transformation from the beginning. So that's affected this change in emerging Thank markets, you. I believe. This is, yeah, I read uh, one article um, that basically pandemic uh, has accelerated three to four times the digitalization. It would happen anyway, but it was very, very fast. So now talking about these emerging markets, or let's even say less technologically developed markets, um, how is it with that to actually start a startup there? What were the challenges you experienced? Um, I think there are um, a number of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities. So when I speak about, when I think about the challenges, I think it's, there are challenges that exist in kind of the external structures that govern how you do your business. So for instance, as a founder who's now based in Ghana, that could be access to investors, you know, that's access to people who can actually support your business to grow. Um, whereas if I was perhaps in the USA, I would have access to people who are readily investing in businesses. So there are some challenges around that. I would say that that's obviously one of the most obvious challenges. And then, you know, especially in our industry where you're hoping that you're offering a service to people um, through technology, um, whether that's the local host, um, making people experience the country you're in, there's also the element of actually training that human capital to actually make sure that even though you might have the technology platform to execute, how are those individuals actually performing and how are they relating to the people who make use of those services? And that's something that we have to do in an emerging market like Africa, where we have to constantly train people in the hospitality industry. However, that said, I want to emphasize the opportunities, right? Um, I think when we were speaking earlier, we spoke about how in the kind of a mobile banking world, for instance, what Africa does in mobile payments, it's not something that exists anywhere in the world. And that's because Africa was able to leapfrog um, the likes of Europe, the likes of America. Um, things like M-Pesa have been so pivotal in Africa's growth in the mobile banking um, um, department. When I think about travel, when I think about what we're doing in Sota Chale, I think about the fact that, you know, Airbnb has a platform to really create communities and connect like-minded travelers so that they're having conversations with each other. But I don't think that it's actually capitalized on that enough. However, because I'm a company that's now up and coming and I can spot the areas that we can improve, I can start thinking around how do I bring like-minded people who are interested in Africa, who want to travel Africa, to have conversations with each other. So in that sense, I see an opportunity to leapfrog what was created by Airbnb. When I look around this room, how many of you have actually traveled anywhere in Africa? Okay, a couple. How many of you would like to travel somewhere in Africa? So there's so many people who would relish the opportunity. And I think as businesses, we really need to think about the foundations of our community. And I see a huge opportunity for Sota Chale to actually create communities of people anywhere in the world who just want to have conversations on Africa, who just want to perhaps go to the local Nigerian lady's house to have some egusi soup or jollof rice, right? And I think those opportunities are there, but I don't think existing business models have capitalized on that enough.
Yeah, definitely. I completely agree. And Chelly, for all of you, just to know, means a friend, right? So, yeah, I really love the idea. And you, you brought up very interesting topic, which is leapfrogging, right? So, from the perspective of the markets that are now emerging, um, they skipped a few, let's say, parts of the technological development, right? So, Tunya, would you say that that kind of thing is actually a challenge or it's actually an opportunity to make even better, faster innovation since there's no legacy systems? Yeah, actually, maybe we can split all the startups in the world into two in that sense. The ones who are thriving on this technological gap in the market and they are trying to solve it. And for this first group, uh, actually, this is not a challenge. Again, it's actually an advantage and they are taking care of, t t taking this advantage while they are selling their product or service. So uh, maybe like the, one of the best examples for this, in my opinion, uh, it would be like B2B marketplaces. For, for example, like as, as, a, as an individual, as a customer, you can buy anything with, a, with, with one click. But as a business who, for example, like if you are pr producing these uh, furnitures, you have to have these metals or etc. Which actually the transactions are in really big volumes and it's so complicated with multiple steps. It's actually uh, near to impossible to digitize it. So B two B marketplaces, for example, it's all it's still in pen and paper like these metal and supplies etc. They're actually. Uh, digitizing this process and they are taking advan taking the advantage of less technologically developed markets. But on the other hand, for the second group who actually struggles because of these challenges, because of these less technologically developed things like especially B2B SaaS, etc. I mean, I was talking about this adoption, but before that B2B SaaS, especially in emerging markets, they were struggling for customer adoption, but not, not also B2B, not only B2B marketplaces, but uh, sorry, B2B SaaS, but also B2B, B2C SaaS, they were struggling with customer adoption. So as an investor, for example, what you can do for these companies is to help them uh, with customer more, much more cu customer discoveries because you are the one who has a whole lot of network of companies with, di with different business models so you can help them with a list and you can enter these calls with them and they can maybe you can guide these calls etc actually this is what we do in a portfolio support aspect of our fund we actually like since we are part of 500 global we have this huge network of all these founders that have ever been invested by Far Founder Global. So we actually utilize this founder hub and we uh, help our companies to make these customer discoveries and these calls. So what you can do is this to help in that sense. But yeah, actually it happens a lot. It's actually usually is a challenge for you, especially if you are taking care of this deep tech solution. Uh, especially like in, for example, like quantum computing, like it's actually like more than a white market. So it's actually like hard to understand and no customer adoption. Even the ones who are building it, they are not 100% sure like what, what, what will be the use case. So yeah, it's actually a challenge and it happens majorly. Yeah, yeah it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. So now going one step forward, talking about the companies coming from most unlikely places. We can take InfoBip as an example, right? We started as a small company somewhere on the seaside in Croatia. And here we are today sitting on this wonderful conference. We went global. Uh, we are the leader in the communication, uh, 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 communication channels. So from that perspective, how often does it happen that the startups from these unlikely places actually go global. Yeah, it's uh, obviously not often. <laughs> and that's what we are betting on as the early stage VCs, like there will be something emerge and that, that will be so big that will save us and it will look so good in front of investors. So it's actually not quite often, but uh, as 500 Emerging Europe, we are betting on this because like, we believe that what Western, Western countries of Europe experienced like 10 years ago is experienced by these Southeastern and Central Eastern European countries. It 
again, it doesn't happen, but after this one trigger, like InfoBib, uh, there is this multiplier effect, which actually experienced in the Turkish startup ecosystem, in the gaming market. Like we actually, we had our first unicorn, which was this gaming company called Peak Games, and it was acquired by Zynga, which is a huge behemoth United States company. And then after it, uh, there, there was this Peak Games alumni, like I guess it was around 80 of them, and they left the company, or the ones who left the company earlier than it was a unicorn, they established their companies out of which I guess like 28 of them are gaming companies and they are raising like huge amount of money. For example, like one of our XGPs, Rina, actually she established her own gaming company, Spike Games, and they raised like five, 56 million dollars or euros or something for a pre-seed round. So this is actually InfoBib was this trigger out of this creation ecosystem. And like we believe that it will it will happen uh, really soon. Wow, thank you. I'd like to add something to that. Sure. I think you made a very wonderful point around the multiplier effect. And I think it's so important for people to see companies of this nature coming out of their geographical locations because it inspires people to go ahead and create things as well. So when I think about a completely different industry from what I'm in, I think about Nigeria and the fintech ecosystem for people like Flutterwave, Paystack, which has now led to like a whole arena of other fintechs who are raising money and being trusted by investors from all over the world. And I think that that's actually the power of trust in local businesses. Um, it gives other people within the markets confidence that there is something there for them. And it also gives investors more trust yeah, in those and businesses. Especially the global investors. I mean, VCs are so focused, especially the ones with gaming focus, obviously. They are so focused on this market. And whenever a peak game or dream game or good job game alumni comes up and say that they are going to establish their own company, they are like, it's inevitable for them to come to them and like talk to them, what, what are you going to do? And they in, immediately invest money. Yeah, so I think we can all conclude it's about the technology and innovation and success just comes uh, as a consequence, right? So it's inevitable. So with that, one of the interesting points from about your startup is that you pivoted in technology and you are using tech to support experienced providers, particularly in Africa. Can you tell us more about it? Yes, yeah, so we are just about to go live with our platform. Um, and I'm super excited about that because, you know, we spent a lot of time doing the manual labor of creating experiences in Africa. However, there's so many other people who want to curate these experiences on the continent. So what our platform will be doing is giving local insiders, local hosts, the opportunity to meet people in the international world, the diaspora, and provide them with their services, quite similar to Airbnb experiences, as I said earlier. But the thing that really makes us unique is the fact that we also want people to experience Africa even if they can't travel. So like I said earlier, if there are people who want to host African experiences in their towns, in London, in Zagreb, in Zada, people can also book those experiences on our platform. Um, and you don't have to travel Africa to experience that. You can stay in the comfort of your country and also experience Africa. And for me, that's so important because I think um, these things should be accessible, not just from a kind of um, the, the perspective of us as a business, but also the people in the continent of Africa who want to earn money from the tourism sphere. Um, tourism is growing at an exponential rate on the con um, continent right now. And I think that as a business, we have the opportunity to use technology to democratize that and give people access to kind, kind of the funding, um, sorry, um, some of the monetary value that they can get from selling their experiences on our platform. And I think that that makes this world a very exciting place. But I also think that there's a huge gap in the market. When you go on Airbnb experiences now, you will probably find South Africa, Kenya on their experiences, but you don't find any other African countries. But Africa is an interesting place and we do have experiences to offer. Why is it that the biggest kind of experiences platform in the world doesn't offer 
experiences in that part of the world. When you go on TripAdvisor via tour, yes, they're offering experiences, but the same experiences probably exist across five other providers. It's not a curated list of experiences. And I think where our uniqueness comes from, particularly in the tech aspect, is that we are creating what would essentially be the first centralized database of curated experiences on the continents of Africa. And I think that that's such an exciting opportunity for me to be in, especially seeing as the trajectory of experiences in Africa is only on the rise. Brilliant, thank you so much. Tunya, what's your um, kind of comment on this? Like how important it is when you're thinking about investing in a startup uh, that they already have like go to market strategy such as with that has and that it's something very disruptive, something that doesn't exist. How do you as an investor help bring that idea to life? Uh, I, actually, I, I was mentioning it before, like it's because like it's like thriving on a gap. It's thriving on an advantage. And uh, the, the, the only thing that you can do as an investor for, for, your, for your portfolio companies who are trying to disrupt some area with a less technological aspect um, only, only thing you can, that you can do is to support them to expand to other other side of these countries that have been started from. So, uh, what you can do is to make maybe help them fundraise for the follow-on round because it actually requires a lot of capital to expand throughout you throughout any, uh, especially less technologically developed geographies. So, um, you have to have this strong network of investors all around the region and also in global re, globally i like especially in the united states so that's why that's how you can help them but actually as an investor that's what you are investing in so you, you cannot actually do a lot because like you are thriving on investing in a founder that has the ability of doing something like this so actually you are relying on the founder yourself rather than being the value adding investor i don't believe that there's such a thing as a smart money i mean the sm being a smart money is the is your job as a vc or an angel investor other than that you're no different than a bank you are just giving some credits or money like for nothing and you have to have this value add and the only and the best thing you can do is to open your network to the founder. Definitely. So, yeah, the, the value added is actually finding your own niche, finding where to play and how to win. So with that, what would be your simple recipe for success when it comes to the tricks of finding your own niche and starting, launching a successful startup? Tough question. <laughs> um, but I will say, honestly, is just being willing to listen to what people want um, and just listening to what your customers are telling you or how your customers are acting. So for us at Sorta Chale, one of the things that has constantly been said, so the word Chale, I mean, it's probably a new vocabulary for you, but Chale is very much known in West Africa. Chale means my friend, my brother. In the UK, it would be like mate. And because of that word, people who experience our services often ask us, um, how do I connect with other chalets? Like, I want to meet the other people who are part of your experiences. How, how do I make friends with these individuals? And that is where we've now found a new stream of how do we create community for people to meet and discuss. Um, and I think that that was born from us being able to listen to what people are saying and also see how people are acting. People wanting to have conversations with people um, who use our services even if they're not part of that group. So for me, honestly, I would say that the way to succeed is by listening. I saw a tweet that said, if you want to build your startup, one of the best ways to do it is just go look at what your competitors are doing wrong and basically create a business around what your competitors are doing wrong. And I think that that was a fantastic piece of advice because it means that you're actually going into the midst of the people and you're listening to them. So that would be my recipe for success. Thank you so much. And Tunya, final question for you, since we're running out of time. What is the one practical advice you would give to someone just starting their own startup? Well, again, network. I mean, as a person who have been operating in a space for, for years, 
the only thing that you can do is to open your knowledge, which is not better than the founders, again. So you're not, I, I don't believe that if you haven't executed some business model y yet, you're not that value adding side on, on this. But the only thing that you can do is to open your network freely and just let your founder, let your portfolio companies use it for their sake. Thank you so much. So that would be it for this panel. With that, I wish you so much luck with your startup. I will definitely book a trip uh, to Africa. Tunya, thank you so much. Continue helping us bringing innovative ideas.